the fires burn day and night. These open-air ceremonies have become a symbol of the COVID-19 catastrophe. And not just in India. Crematoria around the world have buckled under a record surge in COVID deaths. Over 5 million people have officially fallen victim to the virus. But the news magazine The Economist estimates that the pandemic's true death toll is four times higher. Many people who die while infected are never tested, so they don't enter the official tally. Other patients have died of preventable causes because overstretched hospitals could not treat them. And many countries struggle to count deaths under normal circumstances, let alone a pandemic. The official COVID toll could just be the tip of the iceberg. Welcome, I'm Ben Fazulan. Can we put our trust in numbers or the institutions that provide the statistics? In many respects, this pandemic has become a crisis of trust. Just how dangerous or deadly is COVID-19? Well, Uwe Janssens can tell us about the situation on the ground. He's a chief physician at the St. Antonius Hospital in Eschweiler. He's also on the board of the German Interdisciplinary Association for Intensive Care and Emergency Medicine and is in Berlin today for us. Dmitri Kolbach is a data scientist from Tübingen University and joins us from Tübingen to crunch the numbers. Dmitri, let's start with you. What's the likelihood of the global death toll being four times higher than the official rate? This number is very approximate. The official COVID tally at the moment is, I think, around 5 million. I think based on the data, we can be reasonably sure that it's more than twice that much. So it's above 10 million. And I would say it's probably below 20. And um, it's hard at the moment to, um, to know more exactly, because unfortunately, for many, many countries, we don't have any reliable data whatsoever. So this estimate of the economist is an extrapolation from the data we have to large parts of the world where we don't have any data. Uwe, would you say that lines up with what you're seeing and hearing about in intensive care units? Yes, uh, that's uh, exactly the thing we saw last year. We learned a lot about the um, uh, delay in treatment, for instance, in cardiovascular disease like acute myocardial infarction uh, or out of hospital cardiac arrest. And in uh, some regions, for instance, in Italy or in Paris, New York, uh, the death tolls uh, tripled um, uh, uh, in comparison to, uh, to 2019. So it's uh, some figures uh, we now uh, learn and we don't know what will be the effects uh, in the next years because the people don't go to doctors, they don't go to doctors when they have symptoms and so on. So we must get the data, but at the moment the figures are quite unsure. What about excess mortality in the over 80s or, or in kids, Dimitri? That's hard to detect because the, the numbers are so small. Um, we and, and for many countries, the one important thing is that for many countries we don't have this information. Countries, many countries release numbers of the overall deaths, but we don't have yet, or possibly we'll get that later, uh, detailed age breakdowns. Uwe, uh, another question for you. I, I guess some people may think this quite simple, but uh, I guess it could be complicated. How, how do you distinguish between COVID and non-COVID deaths? Yes, it's quite difficult. Um, uh, some people uh, uh, think about it and they say, did this uh, person die from COVID-19 or died he with COVID-19? Was COVID-19 uh, the exact cause for the death or is it uh, just uh, uh, we measured the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the, pe uh, the person died from acute myocardial infarction? But we also know that many of the diseases, uh, for instance, cardiovascular diseases, may, uh, me, may be ag aggravated by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's extremely difficult to differentiate uh, exactly at the time of death when we are in the intensive care unit and you, we have a COVID-19 patient, he dies from multi-organ failure. This is he died from multi-organ failure. When the patient got, got some acute myocardial infarction in um, combination with SARS-CoV-2 and he mm -hmm. dies from myocardial infarction, 
Farage, and maybe that SARS-CoV-2 added to it, and that this was the cause of death. So it's quite difficult, and not all people are um, um, brought in Germany to autopsy. So we don't know the exact figures, and it's uh, in the end the, the 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 doctors who tell this was due or he died with. Mm. Well, when it comes to the figures, Dimitri, what does the world mortality data set show when it comes to other diseases? We see in multiple countries that the excess mortality, which is what we're measuring in the world mortality data set, just tracks the COVID deaths, especially during the COVID outbreaks. The entire excess mortality is explained by COVID. Other contributions are very small in comparison. So we don't, we don't think that with, with, I don't think that with our data set, we can say um, anything about, about other diseases. But I think that the contributions of other diseases to the excess mortality are very small. When we're talking about excess mortality, we're primarily talking about COVID-influenced deaths. Dimitri, will we ever know the true number of deaths from COVID? I don't think so, not very precisely. There are unfortunately large areas in the world where without reliable reporting of either COVID cases or COVID deaths or also all-cause mortality, uh, in particular, I'm talking about developing countries. But I do think that we will know the number more precisely than now. The data come in and many countries release the data later. Um, there are ways to monitor mortality by, for example, monitoring cemeteries that don't rely on official data at all. And these estimates were going to be coming in the coming years and um, the, num the, the, the total estimates will get more precise. Data scientist Dmitry Korbak and Chief Physician Uwe Janssen. great to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a look now, though, at how the COVID-19 pandemic is hurting the fight against other diseases, in particular patients who are chronically ill. At the Marienhaus Clinic in Mainz, Germany, one thoracic surgeon has lost faith in his job and the world. It's definitely very painful for us when we're sat in the tumour conference and realise that our skills can't help any of our patients anymore. When it's too far advanced, it really hurts. Peter Hollaus heads the Marienhaus Clinic's thoracic surgical ward. He's seeing more and more patients with tumours that have grown to the stage where they're no longer operable. They all follow the same pattern. Fearful of contracting the coronavirus, patients let routine checkups slide, all the while their tumours growing unseen. By the time they get to the clinic, it's almost too late. No question about it. It drives you crazy. Because you know that a couple of months earlier, you'd have had a realistic chance of effecting a cure. That means our therapies can now buy a patient some time, but we can no longer offer them the prospect of a full recovery. The Marienhaus Clinic isn't the only hospital experiencing this sad trend. A first German TV station ARD documentary surveyed the 20 clinics with the highest number of lung cancer patients. 71% of those who responded said they were recording an increase in severe cases. Hospital safety officer and patient activist Ruth Hecker sees political failures. It would have been better and highly commendable if the federal health minister had used his social media campaign to consistently raise awareness of this matter as well, said, go visit the hospitals again, go to your GPs. If he'd been radiating confidence, it would have been communicated to the population at large. Germany's health ministry told the ARD journalists it has addressed the situation many times that the minister himself spoke about it in May 2020 and February of this year, as did the Federal Center for Health Education. But that treatment and therapies are up to doctors to decide. They, for their part, expect to see an increasing number of severe cases emerging among people whose lung cancer hasn't yet been recognized. Time for Derek Williams and a viewer question which won't be all that easy to answer, but it's something I'd want to know if I lost my sense of smell or taste. My daughter had COVID-19 months ago and still hasn't regained her sense of smell or taste. Will they come back? 
The sense of smell and the sense of taste are, are closely intertwined and, and losing them is a very common symptom of COVID-19. Um, several studies have shown that the loss of smell or changes to the sense of smell in particular are an issue for at least half the people who get the disease, uh, probably more. Sometimes it's the only symptom that develops in a patient who's otherwise asymptomatic. Um, although there's still a lot that we don't know about what causes the loss of taste, there is evidence indicating that the loss of smell is likely linked not to the virus infecting the olfactory neurons that carry signals from the nose in the direction of the brain, but instead to its infecting cells called uh, sustentacular cells, which play a supporting role in the lining of the nasal cavity. According to an overview of studies that I read, the loss of taste and the loss of smell usually occurs very suddenly at the onset of COVID-19 and often begins to slowly return after around three to five days. Um, many patients had pretty much regained the senses completely within a few weeks, but a significant percentage, maybe as many as one in 20 people, they continue to have major deficits um, even many months later. So your daughter's condition is not all that rare, Inez. Um, if the sensory loss is persistent, a lot of experts, including ones that we've had here on the COVID-19 special, they recommend what's called olfactory training. Um, it involves repeated targeted exposure to specific scents on a daily basis. And it's helped a lot of patients recover at least some sensory perception. Nice to have you along. Stay safe and see you again soon.